but this is the report of Twisted's death, or why Twisted and Tornado are relevant in the Async IO age. I am Amber Brown, I'm also known as Hawk Owl, um, and I live in Perth. It's, it's over there, if you turn around you can actually see it. Um, I work for, I, I I technically do. I am the release manager of Twisted. I've done at least 10 major releases. I've ported at least 40,000 lines of Twisted code to Python 3, so that's been my major thing now. I also delete a lot of code. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've deleted um, approximately 15,000 lines net from uh, Twisted, mainly the old stuff, sort of cleaning it up, making it a lot more you know, sleek and sort of aerodynamic and you know, making the docs not look absolutely horrible. So this is basically my life. So I, uh, my day job, I work for Crossfire.io. Um, it is a open source WebSocket router. So sort of you put it there and it handles all your WebSockets and you, know, you don't have to um, worry about, you know, hooking it into uh, like your Django or your PHP or whatever. Um, so I do binary release management for them across three distributions. So you make it so you can just app get install it. Um, I ported the twisted bits of it and the whole of Crossfire.io to Python 3, so a good chunk of code right there. And I also work on the um, REST integration, which is uh, so that you can talk to it from like your Django using uh, synchronous like requests or something like that. So I did fix the slide. <laughs> I posted this up on Twitter calling, calling uh, Russell Keith McGee because he loves that. Um, that's totally his name. <laughs> so this talk idea originally came from Russell on Twitter, I think. I, I Sounds familiar. Know. Yeah, probably. Um, and a lot of it, or well, some of the some of the core arguments, is based off a blog post by Glyph Levikowitz, the founder of the Twisted Project. So you want to do some I/O. So you know, there's, there's Twisted and there's Tornado and Django and. Async IO HTTP and just you know Django is a bit slow. Can only only serve one thing at a time, like just by itself. You can use runners like Gunicorn or Uwiski or other things that run it in many many processes. So it runs copy. So your Django is still actually processing one request at a time. It's just that you've got lots of instances. And in Python, if you want to hit the fabled C10K, that is 10,000 concurrent connections, like serving them all, not, not per second, just having 10,000 open, threads or processes won't really help you in Python. So here's your server, everything's good, and then it's on fire. So the reason why you can't use threads is that threads are hard to use safely. You run into all sorts of race conditions and bugs and you've got to put seven laws in front of everything and you've got to worry about thread safety. And you can't really use one thread per connection. The thread memory overhead is it's kind of small. It's like 32 kilobytes up to eight megabytes by default on Linux. You know, that's, that's not too much overhead. But if you want to hold 10,000 threads, then you end up having 1.3 gig of just duplicated C stack. Um, which isn't great. Um, you also don't get any parallelism because the Python's global, global interpreter lock means that you'll only be running one bit of Python at any time. So you can be doing 10,000 things of I.O., but if you actually want to process any of those, you've got to spin them into different processes. You also won't do threads properly. You, you just won't. You'll run into race conditions or something will explode. And if you look up on MITRE, the CV, uh, the uh, it's common vulnerabilities. E, what does the E stand for? Exploits. Exploit. Exploits. Yeah, vul common vulnerabilities in exploits database. There's like 500 major CVEs that are <laughs> thread related, so you know, don't don't even try. There's also micro threads and green threads like Eventlet, GeoVent. They're all all good, but they're still kind of threads in that you can't, you know, locally reason about. You can't see how the code will react just by reading the code because they have uh, yield points at random points. You can't control where it yields as much. So you may accidentally run into race conditions. So asynchronous IO, it's, it's pretty good. Asynchronous IO, let's go back to that, is where you have one request, uh, you have one process and one thread 
the handles, all the connections. You don't have, you don't spin them up and running a thread, you don't um, use micro threads, you just have one thread, one process. It uses uh, select and friends, which are um, system level APIs. They take a list of file descriptors, so sockets, or Unix domain sockets, or files, and all that sort of thing, and it tells you what's ready for reading or writing. So you say, out of all these things, what can I do something with? So that's a service as provided by the operating system. They can handle thousands and thousands and thousands of open sockets and events at any one time, um, even on com commodity hardware. I'll actually have a demo still later showing you how effective that can be. Um, so basically what it does is it waits for you know, data to come in and it grabs the data off the socket that's ready for reading or writing and it hands it to the protocol implementation. So that's your thing like HTTP or um, DNS or whatever and then that goes up into like your, your, your web request or whatever. So protocol is sort of the base. It queues sent data um, until you can actually send it because the operating system will fill up its send buffers pretty quickly. It only has like um, a couple hundred K or something of send running, so uh, of send buffer. So if you're sending a 200 megabyte file, you've got to sort of wait until you can send it before you just keep sending it. Because the operating system will go, I can't send that yet, go away. So you have to sort of chop it up and do it bit by bit. So nothing blocks. So twi um, the selector loops or reactors um, actually take care of this for you by just abstracting it away. You say, I want to send this on this transport, and the reactor will go, okay, I'll schedule this for reading and writing. There is higher density per core because you have one core, one process, and one thread. So you don't need threads at all. Like optimally in Twisted, um, you use no threads. You still don't get the parallelism, parallelism because of the global interpreter lock. So it doesn't solve all the problems. But because it's a little bit more efficient with when you're like handing over between the bits of Python, you do get some sort of performance benefits there and you don't have to worry about locking, which takes, takes time and, and is overhead on top. So it's the best case for the sort of thing that we encounter a lot these days. You, you want to do a lot of I.O., so you're sending a lot of bits down, down the pipe. You've got high latency clients, so for example, people that aren't on the same network, that maybe it takes 60 milliseconds to get to, uh, or even a couple hundred milliseconds, and you have low CPU processing. So you're probably waiting on the client to send you data or the database to send you data. So in your normal web application sort of thing, you're not doing a lot of hard processing. Um, and the hard processing you're doing is actually pretty fast in Python. That's the wrong button. Can I back? No. I hate Keynote. Yep. So Twisted and AsyncIO are two such selector frameworks. Now, who here has heard of AsyncIO? Who here has used AsyncIO? <laughs> um, who's used it? So, not as many. Um, who here has heard of Twisted? Oh, yay. Who's used Twisted? Okay, so there's actually more Twisted users. <laughs> That's actually kind of rare. Ten years of history was. Yeah, I mean, you know. Twisted was one of the first. Um, as you can see here, the first commit was in July 8th, 2001, and it had been going on a little bit there um, in its original Java formation before that, but um, and a little bit before that, before version control. So it originally was like... Or was it CVS and then we sort of tried to move to Mercurial up here and Mercurial sucked so it just kept on SVN from like here onwards and now there's Git yeah. get rid of SVN because SVN sucks so AsyncO was introduced much later about nine years later so October 14th 2012 um, so quite new quite new so why a new solution? Why, why was AsyncIO a thing when there was already Twisted and Tornado and all those other ones that, and G-Event and all those ones that already existed? Well, in 2012, Asynchronous IO and Python was a bit of a total mess. There was no G-Event or Eventlet, they only got ported like this year. Um, not much of Twisted being ported because uh, porting to Python 3 at that point was quite hard. 
it's got a lot easier now. And most of Tornado, Tornado had been ported, but that's just a web framework. It's not quite a general purpose asynchronous IO framework as Twisted or Async IO are. Node.js was also on the, was happening, fortunately. Um, and Async Await, which is a new Python 3.5 feature, that came from .NET 4.5. So that, that shipped back in 2012 as well. And Python 3 did kind of need its killer feature. I mean, apart from everything else, you had what's on Python 3? Great, there's bytes, Unicode separation. What good does that give me? Oh, it means I can't use my libraries. Great. 10 out of 10. So, why async IO in particular? Well, it was, it was designed around what's called coroutines. Now, coroutines are a thing found in other languages. Go has their own. Goroutines, sort of the same thing, I think, roughly. Um, they're like a special generator. If you've ever used generators in Python, there's sort of like a thing that implements the iterator protocol. So they sort of, it's an object that you poke it and it gives you values. So it doesn't have all the values ready at one point, it just gives them to you later. So here's some code. This is an example. So you have async IO, you have async def that says, wait, does this have the, no, it doesn't. Oh. Yeah, it doesn't work very well. Um, so async def that says this is a coroutine in Python. So you have a loop. Um, so what this does is it displays a loop until until it is five seconds past its original call. So you use await here. So await there suspends this function so it doesn't keep looping. It suspends it until this fires. So what this async code sleep does is it waits one second and then it fires and resumes um, computation. So uh, other things you'd wait on is like um, uh, getting a HTTP page or sending some data or receiving some data or getting some other stuff. So as you can see it looks very much like synchronous code. Apart if you got rid of the await and just replaced the async code sleep it'll work exactly the same as it did if you were just writing like regular or Python. It's also got the event loop, which is the, the thing I mentioned before with the reactor. So it runs with that and it says run until complete. So it's, so that's a little help thing that says run this coroutine until the coroutine finishes and then close the loop. So it's quite handy. Async also was kind of made to repair the, the sort of the API fragmentation between Tornado and Gevent and Twisted and all those things that had happened before. They all had very different APIs and you couldn't really interoperate between them. So there's this quote here. So the idea was that Asynco had the one API that ruled them all. So everyone adapted to that. And then you know, you'd, you'd write new event loops, but it would talk using the same API. So no matter what you're using, you could use the Tornado event loop with Twisted, or you could use the Asynco event loop with Gevent, or all that sort of thing. So that was the original um, point. It also would have reduced duplication by letting Twisted and Tornado and all that just get rid of their own, own event loops. Just use the one in Python. Don't have to write your own. So eventually they were hoping that Twisted would delete theirs once their port had been finished and then you wouldn't have to worry about maintaining <coughs> that bit of code again. So, since you've got Twisted and since you've got Async IO, they sort of do the same thing, don't they? So does one replace the other? Well, they both do cooperative single-threaded multitasking. So both of them use their coroutines or deferreds or whatever to yield between, so you don't have threads where everything just sort of tries and then the operating system switches between them. Uh, twisted and async I go, I'm going to do this, I'm done, something else can go. Both of them have primitives for supporting this asynchronous programming. Uh, there's features which are sort of like deferreds, uh, coroutines are sort of like the existing inline callbacks. So same, same sort of idea, but you know, slightly different. They do use the same system APIs underneath. So it's let, poll, epoch, kq, and IO complete reports on Windows. Both use it identically. The protocols and transports that async IO uses are directly inspired by Twisted because Twisted had this sort of newer idea where you had a transport, which was the socket, the pipe, the thing that data was coming in on, and then protocol, which actually was the behavior your application had. So you have different transports like a TCP transport or a 
uh, TLS over t TCP transport or a Unix domain socket transport. And they all abstract away the differences between these so that your protocol was separate and didn't actually have to care of what it was running over. So compared to other sorts of frameworks, you can actually write a HTTP client over, say, uh, a Unix domain socket or over some new protocol that hasn't been invented like TCP. As long as you can put bytes over it, it's a transport. The IO loop is very similar to Twisted's. Internally, it uses pretty much the same sort of higher, uh, same sort of uh, layouts because there's only so many ways you can fix the same problem. And it turns out that um, between Twisted and Tornado and Asynco, they all roughly follow the same sort of uh, same sort of design. And it's a standard API. It's just there. If you have Python 3.4, you can install it and you can just use it right away. No worrying about pip. No worrying about you know, updating or versions, or it's just there. So from Glyph's blog post, it was like, you know, the sort of thinking that was happening a lot back in 2013, 2014, when Asynco was first introduced, was that, you know, we've got this one Asynco thing, and then we've got another one. So, you know, this one's old and busted and crappy, and this one's new, so let's use that. I guess it replaces it. And that's not quite exactly what it is. Asynco is like an apple, like a fresh apple, and Twisted is a fruit salad. If you compare the two, so here is the lines of code, uh, mostly Python and C. So you've got Twisted is a whopping great 176,000 lines of code. You've got Asynco is 21,902. You've got comments, so that's comments. So Twisted has a shitload of comments. <laughs> um, if you remove the tests, uh, which both have a lot of, um, then you end up with a slightly smaller number, only 75,000, 74,000 compared to like 8,500. Oh, God damn it. <coughs> the reason why Twisted does a lot of things that Async IO did is because none of these things were actually available back then. You had Async IO Core and Async IO Chat or Pat. Async Hat? I'm actually not sure what it was called. It was in the standard library and it was like Async Hat. It's like, okay. Um, it wasn't very good, so Twisted kind of had to invent its own things. And, you know, you've got, back in like 2001 to even 2010, one huge package was really easy to just distribute, just distribute one thing, install one thing, use one thing. If you compare it to other things of the age, you've got similar sort of sizes. You've got Twisted, which does a lot of things, and Django, which does a lot of things. They're roughly the same size. We have more comments. <laughs> that code's easy to read. <laughs> I've read some of your code. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> also, you've read some of my yeah. code, yeah. Okay, let's just... <laughs> um, so, we don't have any SQL. True. Yeah. Um, so, Twisted is basically asynchronous IO primitives. So, the reactor, deferreds, all that stuff. The tools for doing it, so um, inline callbacks, things that make it easier. You got Python utilities because a lot of uh, earlier Python didn't have a lot of things. Like in Python two, you can't have a exception that you carry as a value without it discarding the traceback or something like that. Like some really dumb things, um, things that Python now does, but we keep around because you know uh, Python three does it, Python two doesn't. So we've got to have our own sort of versions of things. We also have protocols which use all of the above. So you've got your things like SFTP, DNS, uh, HTTP, IMAP, um, just lots of things. And if you actually pair Twisted down to what Async IO does, they're actually kind of the same size. It's just that the rest of the stuff is the protocols. And that's what Async IO does not have. Async IO itself is just the reactor, features, coroutines, and thread executors and a couple other things, so, which is why I've got concurrent features in there. That's all Async IO is, and that's all the pet wants, and that's good. You've just got that core. The Twister's also got that core, and but we do other things. If you compare it to what's actually in Twisted, there is equivalence in the Async IO world for a lot of things. So Async IO replaces much of Twisted Internet in the sort of use cases. Um, AOHP does a lot of the PHP stuff. Um, the SSH client, the DNS client, um, the thread pool is much like concurrent futures in the standard library, all that sort of thing. So it's a lot of stuff in Twisted that's not just those core components. 
There's also a lot of protocols that we have that aren't in async IO yet. So when you add up all the numbers, Twisted's still pretty big, but it does do things like having a DNS server, which is not yet done in, uh, in async IO. But let's talk about Tornado. Who here has heard of Tornado? Oh, cool. Uh, and who's used it? Okay, not, not as many. So it's an asynchronous web framework in Python. It was developed by FriendFeed, uh, which was bought by Facebook. Um, it also, like, FriendFeed also died. Because <laughs> Facebook just sort of actively hired them. Um, IO Stream in it is similar to Twisted's transports as an async code transport. So when you look at all these different frameworks, the same sort of things occur in all of them. Except the protocols are well defined because it is, at its core, a web server. They only need to do one thing. Web, uh, web serving, like HTTP, web sockets, they don't need the sort of general purpose stuff like Twisted does. It does implement its own IO loop. Um, that is mainly a historical holdover. Um, Twisted and async -O can you can use uh, Twisted's and async -O's reactors in Tornado, and you can yield deferreds or futures. So it all, all sort of interoperates very nice. They may remove their IO loop when Python 2.7 is uh, no longer supported. If you look at the history, um, version 1 in 2009 was very much callback based, very basic, sort of like if you wrote original Node, uh, like early Node.js. No real sort of utilities on top, passing around raw call, callbacks, n not even a deferred sort of abstraction. In 2011, they moved to using generators a lot, um, so that made things a lot nicer. You used yields and it sort of acted a lot nicer, it was a much, much easier to understand, much cleaner. In 2013, they moved to using futures as their uh, main sort of abstraction for, fu uh, for asynchronous coding. And now in 4.3, they've introduced Python 3.5 coroutines. Now, they don't use this anywhere in there. It's just for like if you're writing a web application because they still do support Python 2.67 um, and 3.3 up, or no, 3.2 up. So they don't just use it yet. They're a real great example of interoperating because Tornado, you can use async curves, event loop, and deferreds, and all sorts of things, and then there's Tornado on top, which is the sort of web protocol, so they sort of let you use a lot of things, which is great. And is this what Twisted will eventually become? Will we shed our reactor, will we shed the deferred, and will we just use concurrent features, and coroutines, and all that stuff, and get rid of our reactor, and all that sort of thing? Well, after working on it for the past year, uh, <laughs> That's a bit of a hard question to sort of answer. Async is similar, but not the same in a lot of cases. The main focus I've been working on for the past couple of weeks is Async Await, which was introduced in PEP 0492 or something like that. Um, essentially, it, uh, I gave an example of a coroutine style programming earlier. Yeah, there we go. 0492. So introduced in Python 3.5, so only Python 3.5 now. It doesn't work in earlier versions, which is a shame. Um, so yeah, here's an example here. So async def makes a coroutine, you await in a coroutine. So the await just gets the results, um, and there's again a special kind of generator. Uh, yield, who's used yield from in Python 3.3? Okay, so the difference between yield and yield from is that yield from uh, delegates to a sub generator. So when you yield a thing, that thing is a something that is an iterator. While in while when you use yield from, it returns a new iterator. So it sort of separates the concerns a bit and makes it a lot nicer. Um, it allows you to use asynchronous code in a very sort of synchronous style. If you got rid of the awaits, it'd look like you were just using Django and requests. Really, it's like very simple to understand. And it can yield, and while it's waiting for a result, other things can happen. So you end up with a nice sort of cooperative multitasking by going, I'm waiting for this, you can do other stuff in the meantime. We have had a trampoline to use um, yield from, um, yeah, to, to turn deferreds into such a gener generator since like 2006 when it was introduced in Python 2.5. Um, and, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's some code. Um, I actually put in how this code works. I might rush through it because it's really boring. I thought it'd be thrilling and exciting, <coughs> but then I realized that it's just reading twisted source code and that's not a thing 
that really you sort of want to see. So <laughs> here's the core of inline callbacks. So it is a decorator. You you call the wrapped function that returns the generator. You then call inline callbacks with that generator, with an initial result of done and a brand new deferred. We send that into the generator that was first returned, which spins it off. So if you send none into a brand new generator, it starts its execution. So when you call a generator function, it doesn't do anything immediately. So that returns a deferred because it gets to the first yield point, it's like yield from some deferred. We tell the return deferred, so the one that is come from the generator, not the one we made in inline callbacks, to call got result when it fires, which when that fires, uh, oh yeah, we return it because when you call a inline callbacks wrapped function, you get a deferred back because it has to work with all the other stuff. So we say that we're sort of not waiting for a result, we've sort of sent it off. God damn it. Uh, when it when that fires, so when it gets a result, then it calls inline callbacks again with the new results, and it loops through, sends it back into the generator. The generator resumes execution. Um, generators finish by raising stop iteration or our special def gen return, which is sort of a because you can't use the return statement in Python two generators, you have to raise an exception to get a final result out of the generator. Um, you can actually just return in Python 3, which makes it really nice. Um, or, or if you just drop off the end. If you don't return and it finishes, then it'll just do that. Yeah, so uh, there is a special return value thing which raises an exception with a special, special attribute on it to actually get things out of it. Um, because it wasn't until Python 3... Yeah, until like 3.2 or something that they actually thought, hey, be nice if you could actually return a value from a generator. <laughs> so sometimes they'll raise an exception, like generally stuff will break. So we do the uh, we do an error back. So in these three cases, it ends up fired. Now this is a very confusing bit of code, and it's it's made even more difficult when you think of if it works like futures do, which do use the iterator protocol. It would just be the end of it right there. But you might have noticed some code at the bottom that wasn't called because deferreds are synchronous constructs. You can have a you can have a deferred, you can add some callbacks to it, and then you can give it a final result, and it will execute those uh, those callbacks synchronously. So it'll do everything it can right now. Futures are asynchronous constructs. They will actually tell the reactor to uh, the uh, well, the I loop in async A to actually call it with its result. So it means that it is integral that you have the event loop running and operating for futures to work at all. So yeah, as you can see here, like scheduled callback here actually calls the loop, while twisted has the has deferred and the reactor completely separate. The unfortunate thing about this is that if you were to use futures, you kind of have that um, that reliance on the event loop. While with deferreds, you can write completely synchronous code, like you can write Django using deferreds, um, and then just do them synchronously and just use it as uh, for its two-track programming, uh, two two-track style programming, where you have a deferred and then it has an, a callback. Uh, sorry, yeah, a good callback and an errback, and then those go down there and sort of branch out. So you can't really do that with futures as much. So if, there, if the deferred is actually fired, add both will be called synchronously, and that code there will actually be called right then and there. So it's really confusing, but you know, we say that you know it's ran, and then we wait for a new value, and it goes back up and sends it back into loop, and then everything goes around again. Comparatively, the changes for async await are much the same, but simpler. So this is the problem, oh yeah, Code allows you to await on deferred, so not meant to read that, but it's it's much smaller than, than all of this mess. So uh, after that code just there, this lets you do this in Twisted. So you have um, this special little thing called React in Twisted, which just starts up a reactor and gives it to you, um, and it waits for the for it to finish. So you can go crawl uh, deferred. A D equals crawl pages, that returns a deferred, get a callback, which is print, 
we return the deferred to React, so we'll run until you know that finishes. And then this is the real exciting bit here. So deferred protein, async def, for page and pages, results page equals await trek, which is sort of like a twisted requests, uh, trek.content, and then inside that we call trek.get. So what that does is it gets the page and gets the um, content from the page, like downloads it all, right there without using any sort of deferreds in your client code. So it sort of makes it a lot nicer um, to sort of interact with because it's just like you're writing regular Python. You don't even have to, if, if something returns a deferred, you just chuck a wait in front of it, basically. <laughs> makes it a lot nicer. That code there has taken six months uh, two core developers and three twisted contributors to figure out how to fit it in. We don't have a solution for asynchronous iterators, which is the other thing in the async await pep. We can't uh, interrupt between features and deferreds. And there's no real asynchronous twisted reactor yet, because, uh, because interop is hard, essentially. When you have uh, this brand new thing and you're trying to adapt to it, it does take a lot of effort and a lot of work. So expect stuff eventually, but for right now we can't sort of do everything with async.io like it originally wanted to. Now, why is Twisted still worth using? And we've gone into why there's like all the protocols, but there's also async.io protocols that are out there on PyPI, so why is Twisted's worth it? Well, we're released more often, essentially. We have three plus times a year, we're set to have five releases this year, so you, you get you'll get new features faster. While in AsyncIO, you even need to use the PyPI version, which I'm not sure how that works on Python 3.4 or 3.5, or you have to wait for a new Python version. Now that's not good if you want a brand new feature because you're waiting a year or however long it is between major Python versions. Our time-based releases are taken off the tr trunk branch because they're using SVN. <laughs> not, not for much longer. Um, and because of our code um, code review standards, our trunk branch is always stable, so you can always get the latest cutting edge things safely. We have lots and lots and lots of protocols out of the box, like we've got HTTP, we've got HTTP2 coming as well pretty soon. Uh, we've got SMTP, DNS, IRC, and MEA, like the GPS thing, FTP, SSH, just like piles and piles and piles and piles and piles. We've had things, we had MSN support. Who remembers MSN? We also just deprecated Oscar, which is the which is the protocol for ICQ. <laughs> so we're getting rid of that. That's three thousand lines of untested code. Um, but we have a lot of protocols, and a lot of them are well tested, battle hardened, and are used um, like for really major installations. For example, our HP uh, 1.0 and 1.1 implementation is used by Mailgun, which is. Rackspace's sort of Mailchimp sort of thing, so they send out millions and millions and millions of, email, of um, emails a day and have their web interface with it and all that sort of thing. Um, I do know of um, our NMEA being used at a major um, airline manufacturer, for example. SSH was used by Launchpad back in the days the Launchpad was relevant before GitHub came and ate their launch. It's super easy to make your own protocols as well. So if you have something but you kind of want to write your own or you want to reverse engineer something that hasn't been made yet or, you, or you've got like the, the version of it, the specifications of it, but you want to write your own sort of protocol to interface with it because it might not be a Python or a Twisted one yet, well, you can do it real easily. If it's a line-based protocol like HTTP is, you can just, like this code here is a fully functional thingy mobile. You just make a protocol, you say when line is received, you print the line, and then you tell it, okay, we'll make a factory for this protocol, then will make new ones on each connection. You make an endpoint, which just says, put on TCP port 7000, uh, listen, and then run the reactor. So, um, there is established library support. We have a lot of libraries, Twist is 10 years old, actually longer than that, 14 years old? Yeah, it's old. Um, so we have a lot of libraries, and not all of them are commonly up to date, but we do have a lot of protocols just out there that are implemented, and because Twisted is sort of been the same over, roughly overall for its history, a lot of them still work with even minor modifications. If you're like, I need to interface with this SCO box from like 19... 
O one, <laughs> then you, you can probably find something for it. So here's an example: um, TX Hackme and TX SNI. So who's heard of Let's Encrypt? Yeah, Let's Encrypt is great. For those that don't know, Let's Encrypt is a service that lets you get free SSL or TLS certificates for free entirely. So what this does is TXACME is a implementation of the protocol that Let's Encrypt uses and TXSNI is a server name indication which is a thing <coughs> so that uh, when you send a web request it can work out what certificate to send back to you if you're like serving lots and lots of hosts on one IP address. So that means that if you start up, if you go here, if you replace this with um, TXACME um, colon le colon that, what they'll do is they'll start up a TLS server and automatically get the certificates. So that means that when this stuff lands in, I'm actually planning on adding this to Django channels, that when, you're, when you've got a Django app and you want to run your Django app, it is literally you turn on TLS. No worrying about downloading certificates or buying certificates or anything like that. You just do it up, switch it on, and everyone goes and gets a completely modern, um, completely secure TLS connection to your website without you having to do anything, which is really fantastic and hopefully will make um, a lot of things a lot easier when you've got those sort of small websites. Like when you've got... Um, like you go, oh, here's this cool little thing I made, except, you know, you don't want going through the clear, just turn on TLS. Completely free, which is brilliant. It's also Hendrix, which is a whiskey runner on top of Twisted. It supports WebSockets, TL uh, it supports TLS, not the automatic TLS yet, but TXFME is quite new. Um, and you can just run Twisted code inside your Django code. It's um, been around for a little, little while. It's sort of the reverse of what Django Channels is. Actually, who's heard of Django Channels? Yeah, okay, so Django Channels is, for those that don't know, is a thing by <laughs> Andrew Godwin. Yes. Why was I about to call him Andrew Go uh, Gaynor? <laughs> Go down, Alex Gaynor. <laughs> um, so by Andrew Godwin, who brought 1.7's migrations. 1.7? 1.7. .7. Yeah. Yes, 1.7's migrations. So he's a clever chap, basically. Um, so this is sort of the reverse in that this is a runner that runs your Django in it and then you do all sorts of th sorts of things in that. While Django Channels is sort of you have um, your Django Channel server which is actually coincidentally based on Twisted. Um, and then you have your Django runners and then they talk through that. So it's a bit different. Um, I should also put libraries, I forgot to put Django Channels up there because Django Channels default one right now is based on Twisted, so. There is also Autobahn Python, one of the things I work on, yay! Um, so you can just do WebSockets really easily with that. You just get WebSockets and you can write your own uh, sort of application protocols on top of it without really having to write much code or understand the intricacies of WebSockets itself. Our compatibility policy is quite robust. If you have some old Twisted code, you can update it and it'll probably work. We try not to break your code because happy users are users that keep using us. So we will give you a year of warning for anything that we're deprecating, which is quite good because we've got time-based releases. So that means that if you've got a Twisted application, all you need to do is just occasionally run it on the latest version of Twisted, turn on deprecation warnings with dash w all to your Python interpreter, and they'll tell you if your tests are calling deprecated code. So you can get on top of it and not have breaking changes, and then it's sort of incremental, so when you're migrating from, say, Django 1.6 to Django 1.7, there's a lot of changes. When you migrate from Twisted 16.0 to 16.1, there's quite a few changes, but over the same amount of time, there is still a large amount of changes. So if you keep up to date, it's very, very low cost to stay on a latest version of Twisted, and even several versions of Twisted, like BuildBot, which is uh, a major Twisted user, supports like Twisted 8.2 still, which was released in 2008, and it still supports it to 16.1, so which is pretty fancy. So you can upgrade with Impunity. You can just go, I'll just upgrade Twisted. I'll run my test against it. It works, push it into prod. Don't have to worry. Our code quality is fairly high, um, especially for older 
um, Python projects. Our branch and code coverage is about 88%. Uh, a lot of the missing code is like we've got some Takinta um, GUI <coughs> scripts which are nearly impossible to test, so we don't test them. And they're old and crap and I'm deprecating them and next year I'll remove them after everyone will get, after all the zero users that use that untested code gets a deprecation warning. Um, our core APIs have like at least 95% coverage for a lot of it, depending on how old it is. The older code isn't as great, but the newer code is like 100%. We have 100,000 lines of code to test, like we are mostly tests, which is pretty great because you can change things and not have to worry about it breaking something that you haven't tested because you can go, look, this code is tested, it'll probably work. We have a code review as part of our culture. Nothing gets into trunk without being reviewed first. Nothing gets into trunk without going on our automated test suite first. It works excellent on PyPy, which is the high performance Python interpreter. So if you compare this here, so the blue is PyPy, and those are Python 2.7, 3.4, and 3.5. So as you can see, for pretty much everything, it completely blows it out of the water. Um, there's any from anything from like a two times increase, which is like when you're handling um, connections, so um, TCP connections. The SSL on all of that is limited basically by the speed of your computer doing the TLS encryption. Basically, so not much gains from that, but for regular connections you get like a two times benefit, for some things you get like a five times benefit, for some tests you get like a ten times benefit. So, and that's just by switching out Python on the command line to PyPy. Live demo. Who, who loves live demos? Me. Okay. So what I'm going to do... I'm just going to move this. Okay. So I'm going to go... So what I'll do here is I will... I've got a couple of scripts in. So I will do PyPy C10K. I'll pop up the U limit. The U limit is how many files you can have open at once. Um, by default on operating systems, it's pretty low just because if you open too many files, then the operating system sort of slows to a crawl. So, cool. So, that number there is the number of connections it's got open. So, if we go by my client. I've run this test like 20 times and Mac OS X's networking is really crap. I should have done it so Yeah, there we go. So this is concurrent connections. So there's how many open connections it's got and how many pings per second it is doing between the two. So currently we have hit C10K on a standard MacBook using PyPy. Okay. 12,000. So that's that's about at the limit where the operating system starts falling apart. Um, if it was on a Linux box, I could probably do like 30, 40k connections on this hardware. So that's just open connections. That's nothing really special. But you, when you're sending like 11,000 pings a second, you can't really do that in something like Django because you know it's sort of the one request per time, and then your runners have it, and then you might have um, like what's a standard. You have like four processes and eight threads per. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Processes, yeah. So like four processes, and then how many how many threads you want to put on that? And each thread can only have one connection open at once. So what happens is the operating system just holds it and just doesn't open it until the Django runner is finished. So the cool thing is that Django channels will get sort of this and you'll be able to open as many connections as you want and then Django will process them. Um, and the way that Django channels works is that you have a thing that accepts the requests and then your things that process it. So if you want to handle 10,000 things, you don't have to worry about one thing doing it and having some load balancing things. 
the Twisted there will handle your 10,000 connections, and then you just have a lot of servers. And then the Django only needs to worry about handling one at a time. So that makes it quite neat. So this is sort of, you know, it's a pretty cool demo to, to be able to do that many connections because up until C10K was a major problem until like 2007-ish. Yeah, and I, I think only really Nginx can really handle it because Nginx is pretty awesome. So yeah, as far as like your sort of frameworks, um, your asynchronous IO framework can like async IO if you wait for it long enough can do that as well. You can hit 10,000 clients with that because it's still using the same base APIs except PyPy is a lot faster. So, so eventually you'll be able to use that with your Django, which would be great because then you'll get you know your cake and eat it. Um, you have well, we have many officially supported platforms. So officially supported in this context means that the test must pass on it at all times and it must pass before branches are merged. So we've got like a lot of Ubuntu's, Debian, CentOS, Fedora, FreeBSD, Windows 7, OS 10.10. Um, we support Python 2.7, 3.4, 3.5, and earlier versions support 2.6 and 3.3. They mostly still work, but you know we don't test them anymore. PyPy is very close. There's a couple of tests that do sort of C Python assumptions because the garbage collector is slightly different in that uh, C Python's is a ref counter one where if it goes out of scope it deletes it immediately. PyPy's doesn't quite work like that because it's sort of slow when you have a just in time compiler. What is PyPy? Oh, PyPy is a um, Python interpreter written in Python that compiles down to C and then it just in time compiles your Python code. So it's like um, the V8, but for Python. So it's sort of the, your hot paths, your internal hot paths get compiled into uh, native machine code and then that's run rather than interpreting Python. So PyPy is slower when it doesn't do that and then when the JIT kicks in, it gets really quick. So um, which, is, which is really great. It's also uh, written in Python, so you can actually extend the compiler in Python, which is really great, rather than using like C Python's C. You don't have to sort of know C to do it because it's just a it, it's uses something called R Python, which is just a very simplified set of Python that doesn't do any really hard tricks, and then that gets compiled to C. Um, Python three point four and three point five is coming to Windows. All those Windows users, yay! <laughs> I've, I've had the branch open, but Windows just likes doing things differently. Competition is also good. I mean, you've got async error, you've got gevent, you've got twisted. It's, it's all good because they all do things differently. They all do their own thing uh, slightly better, and it means that you get to steal features from the other ones. Like we stole async error's async away, and we get to keep it. And they stole our transports, but we've got them too. So. And you know, Twisted and Tornado fit in this ecosystem only as, com even if only as competitors. Something to keep things moving because when Python uh, standard library doesn't have anything competing against it, it kind of stagnates. But if you have that ex sort of external pressure on it, things get quite quite good. Uh, like how uh, PyPy and other such efforts have sort of led to some um, sort of more consideration in the Python in, in the C Python developers about speed. They've gone, this is a thing, and people use PyPy because they want speed. What can we do? I that's the yeah, right. Let's go. Um, questions. If you want to say words at me, do it now. But if you want to make statements, do it after. I was going to say so. Like when you were talking about Django channels using Twisted, does that mean that they're going to be dependent on each other? Like channels is going to depend on twisted, or is it using some of the some of the kind of components or something? Like that? So um, it it does use like so. What it does is the part of twisted in channels is that you have the sort of accepting server, which accepts the requests, serializes it down into something called ASGI, which is the asynchronous server gateway interface sort of thing, which is sort of like whiskey but for asynchronous stuff. And then that, and then that gets sent to Redis or I think Redis or it's like a memory a, store. yeah, like a memory store or a database sort of thing. And then your Django runners pick it up off there. So your Django here doesn't actually have Twisted with it, 
and it's just the accept part. Right. Okay. Um, I accept because ASCII is sort of it, it's not Twister Ryan, like you could write an async IO one. It just happens that the current one isn't twisted and you know there might be ones in async IO, there might even be ones in C or Ruby or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Because it just gets put on Redis queue, serialized down to JSON or mem no, or the other one. Okay. No, no, the not memcache, the, the sorry, the serialization format. Um, yeah, one of them. Uh, the the good one. <coughs> Message pack, that's it, um, or like something like that, and then put it on the database. So sure. sort of, sort of separation there, but yeah. still part of the whole system. Um, any other question? My head's leaking because of all the information that um, you're trying to pack in. Is yes. there any like blogs or um, tutorials that you could recommend for people who really do want to start learning about? like asynchronous Python and production style using Python to serve stuff and, and just all the heavy duty shit you've been talking about. <laughs> Certainly, um, actually how long was that? That was... About 45 minutes. 45, oh god, I've got to compress it down. Oh god. This is a 45 minute talk at PyCon US, so... Um, you're good at deleting things, I mean, I mean, hmm? you're good at deleting things. Oh yeah, I've got, I've got to delete all that thing about inline callbacks because you don't need to know that. It's better if you don't know how the sausage is made. Um, but yes, for that, um, there is, uh, there's, so, it's a little bit difficult because when you've got, a, when you're teaching asynchronous programming, uh, in Python especially, you've got all these people have come from Django, all of that, and then you're sort of explaining how to use Python things. So there's no, there's no real good thing for everyone that everyone will get something from. But probably the best thing to do is to look at AsyncIO's documentation is pretty good to get the sort of the, if you use Python 3.5 and AsyncIO's documentation, it's a lot easier to sort of learn how all those things work because they've got the async await and the sort of the syntax that makes it a lot easier to understand. But the biggest problem is kind of um, understanding that your operations are sequential, but some of them happen later. And when you have that that happens here, it's not quite the same as it is in blocking code because other things could have happened in the meantime. So it's sort of, the framework is relatively easy to learn, but sort of getting your head around that, you know, um, that you can't really do, I, I guess you can in Python 3.5. Now, uh, earlier, before you had all this sort of stuff, and you had like deferreds or raw callbacks, it was really hard to understand the sort of the flow of your program. So a lot of the sort of learning how to do it was learning how to structure your program so that you could understand it. Um, now that you've got async await, it's a lot easier. Um, as for that, I would recommend reading some production um, async code or twisted code. That's, that's really good. Like, no tutorial in the world will really show you how, how they both work better than just reading how it happens because you can use a lot of words to say this calls a function and that's probably the biggest problem that the twisted docs and partially the async arrow docs have is that they overcomplicate things, which is a shame. But yes, I would recommend the async arrow docs. They're very good and then you so they're not crap. <laughs> twisted docs are kind of all the crap in some areas, which I'm trying to fix, but you know, you, can only do so much in a day. And that guy you mentioned before, Godwin? Andrew Godwin. Andrew Godwin. Godwin. Yeah, I think, I think it was his blog, or I think he writes a good blog post about yeah, this stuff. And so, yeah, I think the one that I read recently was he covered, like, the why. Yeah, that too, yep. Yeah. And he also gave more examples of, like, how you do it one way versus another. Like, so um, oh, yeah, another one is Glyph's blog, so which is glyph.twistedmatrix.com. I believe if you just said Glyph Twisted blog, it'll come up. I can't actually remember what URL is. He actually talks about some of the, he's got a good blog post called Unyielding, where he talks about sort of threads and um, asynchronous programming like this and how that helps you scale and like sort of what your scaling characteristics are and what that means. Um, there's also, he's got one about async IO and Twisted where he talks about sort of, you know, what's the same sort of like what I've done. So. Those are good things to check out. Um, I also uh, got the Zeno Ryan book on Twisted. Which yes. I found really useful. Um, so 
um, the, I sort of understood about yeah, the, callbacks beforehand. Mm, the, yeah. the book is good. The unfortunate thing is the book is very old. Um, it was re last released 2008. There is a lot of things that have changed in Twisted. Like, we have added a lot of new things to Twisted, like endpoints, which means that you don't have to do listen TCP and all of the nasty stuff. And we've got like a whole new logging system that's like structured logging. So the book is, is a good starting place, but nowadays there's a lot easier ways of doing things because we've had sort of the experience of, oh, this API is total crap. So let's run a new one. So. Um, in a in a way, it sort of makes my head hurt. <laughs> I would just recommend looking at partial learning. Mm -hmm. Just Google it, and it's a really good structured way of encapsulating all the asynchronous stuff and mm. thinking about things. Um, the other question was with the deprecation. Microsoft, when they're selling stuff, if you're not selling a certain so to speak, you know, typically it's five years for selling something, and then ten years mm -hmm. or so to support it. Why, why do you deprecate stuff? Um, so what we have, uh, technically it's at least one year, but much later. We've had stuff that's been deprecated for a long time. The reason why we deprecate things quicker is that the things that, like the core components <coughs> of Twisted, have stayed much the same. But we've mostly deprecated protocols, which have fallen out of use, like MSN. Or we've deprecated packs that now have a much easier and much better way. So if there's something useful and a project is using it, we usually won't deprecate it, so you won't have to worry about that as much. But we get rid of it quickly just because if you if you stay sort of on the latest twisted, which is sort of hard to do with sort of Microsoft products because like Microsoft products and other larger things, um, because they sort of like here's all these changes, um, that sort of thing. Why well, aren't you I suppose I don't know. It's just more so as a recommendation because if you can increase the deprecation period, um, more businesses will like to stuff in it because a lot of projects are running, you know, they're, they're planned over a year or two implemented and then it might be 10 or so years before another team mm. gets to redo it. So that's, that's my only concern is if you can make them longer. And this is a security issue. Also. Well, we, we have uh, security issues actually. Um, uh, exceptions to the deprecation policy just because if there's a security issue, screw deprecation, we need to fix it. So the reason why it's a year minimum, so that's that's only a minimum. It's not that we do it in a year. We've had things deprecated for like five years that and things that we've deprecated that we say that like you shouldn't do this. We handle the case where you do, but you really shouldn't because your code should be handling it, like things from like two thousand eight. Um, that are still in there, and even even before. So it's mainly that because we're open source, we don't have a lot of the ability to uh, support those things so much longer. So, but the good thing is that we don't usually deprecate much. So we haven't run into the issue where we've had many major sort of projects we've deprecated something underneath. Them. We have had one or two cases where we've changed the security thing underneath them. Like at one point, there was some inadvertently, um, inc inadvertently hard-coded private keys. That was fun. Um, it was just for a thing that you meant to use for a demo, but then we found out that like someone was actually using them. We're like, oh god, why are you using that? So, <laughs> so we removed that pretty quickly. But you know, it's because none, or well, some of us paid. Um, like I was a fellowship uh, person for a while. Um, that we just can't support multiple versions and multiple historical ones. But generally, people just stick on the version of Twisted and it sort of works and they just don't get the new features. Um, and then at that point, then it's just, they just have to backport the security fixes, but we've only had like one CVE in the past 14 years. So it's not like there's been many major catastrophic things. Because we're in Python, it makes it a lot easier. We don't have to worry about like use after freeze. It's great. So, yes. Right. Thank you very much, Amber.